Hey guys, welcome back to this week's pull, or as Josh would like to say. What are we reading? And we've got an action-packed episode for you guys today. This is the Marvel segment. We've been uh, splitting it up between like DC and Marvel because it seems that viewers really uh, responded to the last time we did this. We're going to try it again, see how it works out. But um, I'm, of course, I'm here with Dallas and Josh. Say hello, fellas. Hi. Hola. All right, and this time we have a powerhouse issue to go after with uh, today. The Amazing Spider-Man number one from what I'm going to say is a powerhouse team of Nick Spencer and Ryan Otley. Nick Spencer, you might remember, did um, he did the Captain America series where he was Hydra Cap. Sam Wilson. He also did Sam Wilson, Captain America, and he did write Secret Empire. Now that he also did, uh, what is it, Superior Foes of Spider-Man? Yeah, that sounds right. He's done a couple other things I can't remember. I think he even did an Ant-Man thing. Or um, Lethal Foes. Lethal Whatever. Either way. Yeah. So, guys, if, if that scares you a little bit, if that turns you off from this, please do not let it. We all three, we read this issue. This issue, I often say did something didn't blow my hair back. This issue blew my fucking hair back. This was a great uh, issue, and it starts off, basically, it's just kind of a recap of where Peter has been, where he's going. Um, it's setting up, it's basically setting up Spider-Man the way we all know and love Spider-Man. It, it's got that classic Parker luck following him around where this guy just doesn't seem to be able to catch a break. There are numerous nods to the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, but again, in a very good way. There's a couple references to other uh, pop culture things, but oh, yeah. my god, is this issue just a fucking treat. And I think we're going to spend a good amount, a little, good little chunk of time here talking about Spider-Man 1. Dallas, what do you want to say about Spider-Man 1? First off, you open it. Beautiful, and I mean beautiful artwork. Oh yeah, Ryan beautiful. Otley killed is it. a master at he his craft. Killed every character. There wasn't one single drawing that I was like, eh, like everything it was beautiful. And the story was so good too. But the artwork at times, like I just stopped to admire it. Like the first yeah. page, I think I spent like three minutes on. There's not that many word bubbles on. on I mean, the he'll page. even the wraparound cover. Oh, it's fucking Demands beautiful. you to you know, oh, yeah. take a look. It's oh god, but writing was great. I mean, this story. I, I didn't think you could top this last run on Spider-Man because it was amazing. Yeah, but this, Dan, yeah. I want to see a few issues of this, but this really has me more excited than when I picked up Spider-Man 790, was it 3? Yeah, and you said that was one of your favorite arcs in recent favorite. years. Yeah. So this one's really getting me excited. So that's all I've got to say on it. I'll let you guys for a little bit. Josh, how do you feel about Amazing Spider-Man number one? What a perfect tribute after the death of Dicko, right? Right. Because this, like talking about this, about to talk about it gives me now chills. I, now I feel like there's a conspiracy theory they killed Ditko <laughs> off for this book. No, but I'm just... Uh, no, no, this no, book no. tells itself. You don't need a death no, or... No, uh, But this, like, takes... Like, what Dan Slott did with Spider-Man was great. It was, like, there's no argument. Phenomenal. He changed, he, grew, he changed Peter Parker. He grew Peter Parker. This takes you right back to the feel of, like, traditional... Like, we're talking early Spider-Man. It has the same kind of conflicts, the same kind of heart... The humor, uh, I mean, the intensity, the action, I mean, it, it has everything that you would want in a Spider-Man book. I mean, this honestly could have been, like, this is like a movie. This this book was almost like watching oh, yeah. a, like a short Spider-Man movie. Again, it had, like you said, it had heart. It literally gave me, at times, goosebumps. I had goosebumps. There's a there's a great scene where Spider-Man's talking to Anne May, and my God, did it. Oh, it was chilling. Heartbreaking, too. It was so good. Oh. There were multiple moments where I literally laughed out loud at some of the jokes that Peter's cracking, man. There's... Uh, the, you know, you kind of go through some of your favorite hits of characters that appear through here uh, and villains and stuff. But yeah, sorry, I'm just saying. Like this mo this book was an absolute movie. It was, <laughs> it was like a movie, movie, but there was like an emotional roller coaster to oh, this yeah. book. Yeah. It, it's just it has everything. I mean, it literally everything. Yeah, you, you're seeing the conflicts of his life, the conflicts of being Spider-Man, how those two are meshing together, and it's causing and this. It's the just a classic. It is a classic Spider-Man tale. It's what you get from it, but at the same time, still modernized, still oh, yeah. fresh. Uh, the artwork, Otley, just automatically kills it. And if you've ever read Invincible, like at, 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 after a while, I started thinking about. It, I was like, Otley definitely should be on the Spider-Man book. Yeah, just the way he draws uh, Invincible. The, every single every single issue. Mark's suit is torn up and tattered, just classic Spider-Man style almost. But not only that, but he also gets a chance. Uh, there's a big spread uh, splash page where you can see Captain America, yeah. Iron Man, oh, Thor, G-Hulk. Like he got his chance to to draw, draw every everybody. everybody in the MC, oh, the MU, the Marvel, uh, Marvel He's Universe. so stuck on it being a movie. It's I know it feels MCU so now. movie like it's just very cinematic. Yeah. <laughs> 
the one thing I, I love the fact that we're we're seeing some characters and some and then like they're not changing them to make them make more sense. They're keeping some characters in the same kind of character suit design, and I'm talking about certain villains. Um, they keep them in the same kind of suit design, the way that they traditionally look, right. and keep them with the traditional It feels origins. like a modern Dicko artist exactly. rendering, you know? Exactly. Why well, it's a perfect little tribute to Dicko before this, even though this was planned out, like they didn't know Dicko was gonna die, right. or there's conspiracy theory. <laughs> <laughs> but, you heard it here, folks. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, there's so much about it. It's just very nostalgic, but at the same time, new. I, I have a hard time kind of like picking out the two. It's it's visceral too. That's the thing. Like I just mm -hmm. you just feel this book as you read it. Like it's not one of those books that you just kind of casually flip through. This thing absolutely demands your attention as you read it. You know, when we were kind of like talking through it. I was like, Dal, stop fucking interrupting me while I'm reading this book. You know, I'm just I was sucked into it. And like I said, we go we go through such a, a spectrum of emotion with with Peter here. I mean, we and I did not think Nick Spencer like you know reading Secret Empire, having read Captain America, I didn't think he could lend a voice to Spider Man that would feel like classic Spider Man. Yeah. But Aww. dude's witty. He's snarky. He's nerdy. He's kind of a bumbling idiot at some point. You know, it's just. I don't, it's got all the ingredients to make the best Spider-Man cake possible, you know? That was actually one thing I was going to say, too, was uh, uh, before we read this, we were we were eating and we were talking about this book, and I was kind of like, I'm kind of worried now, like, the more I think about this book, because I read Secret Empire. I wasn't a fan of Secret Empire. It just wasn't executed well. Nick Spencer doesn't really, I can't really see him writing on it, even though I can see Otley drawing, uh, drawing for it. And then, uh, so I was a little worried about it. Then I start reading this, and just within the first couple, like, first few pages, I'm sitting here going, like, man. Because one thing that you need when you're, like, writing for Spider-Man is you got to find that perfect balance of compassion, humor, and intelligence. Yeah. And he just gets it all in there. Oh, yeah. In the, perfect in the first couple pages, all worries were just put to bed. You know, like, yeah. you, just, you were just like, oh shit, I'm in. Like, yeah. I'm strapped in and I'm going to take I'm gonna take this ride with you, Nick Spencer. No offense, Slot. You did a great job, but now it's just nice to have a I fresh I will say it was funny. Uh, Nick Spencer even kind of took a jab at Slot a little bit. with He uses the word brand new day here. Yeah, and yeah. It, and it's very obvious that, that it, it's kind of a slight. But, you know, Dan Slot's even come out and given him, himself some flack over that. So, you know, I think it's all in good fun to get a little jab but I, you know you even get to see the way the other heroes kind of react to Spider-Man the way they kind of feel about him even if it's just a one or two passing lines you know ugh you okay right um, you know you get to see Daredevil you get to see an interaction with Johnny Storm which I some... do want to point out that we were talking about references I caught it. They're not sure if it was an intentional or not. Yeah, I'm sure it a, was intentional. There's now, a Star Wars reference to A New Hope in the cantina where he says he doesn't like you. I don't like you either. Johnny says it to Spider-Man, and it was just great. Like, again, showing, like, they're nerds. They like other pop culture things right. and they're putting it into it. And my opinion on the Spider-Man book, the only thing I think they could have added to make it, like, damn near perfect is just a little bit more of the city interaction. I'm not saying this book isn't good, but to make like the definitive Spider-Man to go, no one's ever read Spider-Man before, this is the book you need to read. If like a little bit of New York was in there, it's the only thing, then you'd go, this is literally the true Spider-Man, because it briefly yeah. even touches on his origin, even for like two panels. But it's just showing consequences because of something that happens in the book. And I just absolutely love that. The best part about that too is when they reference his origin, they don't like, Go, they don't even say any words. They just show two panels. I am the right. spiderest man alive. No, <laughs> uh, but no. What they do, they do a good job too. Uh, Spencer does a great job with Mary Jane. Like she's not even in the book very much, but the thing is, she feels like a real character with real history uh -huh. with Peter. And that's something that I feel like has been missing from Mary Jane for a long time. I think Slot started to get the ball rolling on that in his last arc, but Mary Jane is great in this too. And I just, I don't know. I can't praise this book enough. Uh, I, I really can't. Real. Yeah. Yeah. You this know, it's. A... I feel like I had something more to say, but now I can't remember. This this book you're is getting too. You're getting too excited. Me. It floored me. I just did not. I mean, in my opinion, uh, this is a great jumping on point for anybody who's never really read Spider Man. And so, if you were like, "Hey, I never really read it. Have I've been gone from the book for so long?" There's a huh. he organically recaps everything that's been happening with Spider Man. But um, this is a, this is a great jumping on point. But I gotta say, guys, this. I don't know if I've ever really read a more perfect single-issue comic book. 
this is this is probably the perfect book. So we are going to unveil our um, our new rating for today. I'm giving it five out of five couch Cheetos. Five out of five. Five out of couch five couch Cheetos. I don't think I've given anything five out of five. This book. This is the first time. This is over. This is bigger than your Thor or Iron Man, which yeah. you were just. And I'm not. And Spider Man's not my favorite character, but this book is great. All right. So mine might come as a surprise as well. Spider-Man is my favorite Marvel character. Daredevil's right behind him, but this is the one I've read my entire life. And I never give anything a perfect rating. I never. There's like a handful of movies that have ever gotten a perfect rating from me. And Justice League almost got a one from me, though. <laughs> no, let's, let's not talk about that. I was BBS blinded by does. excitement, and I've gone back and reevaluated. And recanted, okay. Anyways, I'm also going five out of five. Five out of five? Five out of five, oh, what? Damn. Couch? Couch? Cheetos. Couch Cheetos. Five All out right. of five And couch Josh, Cheetos. your rating for Amazing Spider-Man number one. I was actually going to give it five out of five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to give it five out of five. Oh my yeah. god, this is so, never I was really, happened. Yeah, I was like really going to be like, man, I'm going to say five out of five, and these motherfuckers are going to be so, like, dude, there's always room for improvement. And I'm just like, no, dude, I close. love this. I could, I, even though it's a giant, like an extra, it's a, like an extra, a giant size, actually, uh, book. I could reread that Damn at least two more times. Near perfect. This issue. is the first ever on the channel. Perfect. First and the ever. first ever trifecta. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Two firsts I mean, all we need is a, one. to hit 700 subscribers, and then all from us hit having a five, all three of us having five out of five on the comic book. That yeah. should get us 700 right there. Right there. Yeah. At the time of this recording, it's still 6.99. Um, but guys. We could not recommend this book enough. I can't wait for the next issue of this book. Which also another great thing about this book, it is bi-weekly. Yes. yes. So every yes. two weeks we're getting this book. Oh, I can't wait. Honestly, this book is so good. I don't give a fuck about the other books we have to talk <laughs> yeah, about. Yeah, I know. So That's how I feel. Let's just podcast over, guys. Yeah, let's just get this over with. What are we going on with next? So Jake and I both read X twenty three. We did. And I'm gonna try to hide my bias and excitement for the Amazing <laughs> Spider Man to talk about it. Um, I'm not too familiar with X-23, the character, but it does briefly touch on her origin, so it caught me up. So that's very good when you're not, it's it's a good introductory book for me. Yeah. I didn't know a whole lot about her. It goes, hey, here's my origin. Let's move on with the story. So it didn't linger with it. It introduced you to her sister, Gabby, Gabby mm -hmm. who is an interesting character. She's kind of the comedic relief of the comic. What's her whereas... superhero name? Gabby? Is it like Honey Bear or something like that? No, I don't think they, they addressed don't. her. They just oh, yeah, it's Gabby. Honey Badger, I think. Honey Badger, yeah. 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 They just call her Gabby in this one, and I don't really... Well, she they called her, her Laura, HB. but they, they called her Laura once, but yeah. I, I don't know that they said X-23. Anyways, <laughs> um, you get introduced to the plot. They're trying to stop this organization from cloning mutants because they see it as wrong, and they want to shine a new light on mutants and clones that they're not all bad. That's the general gist of the book. Um, it does have humor. I thankfully read this before The Amazing Spider-Man, so I have my opinion set aside. Um, action was great. There wasn't a whole lot of it, but when it was there, it served a purpose. It wasn't unnecessary Michael Bay explosions. Um, I enjoyed it. What did you think of the book? Um, first off, the writer is Mariko Tamaki, which is Mariko always reminds me of Wolverine anyway. And then uh, artist is Juan Cabal. Not not a creative team I'm very familiar with. Uh, for me, this book, it, it was okay. Uh, Gabby annoyed the hell out of me, I'm not going to lie. Really? I thought that character was super annoying. I don't know any little girl that talks the way that she talks. I see it as an adult interpretation of how a little girl talks, but I, it, I don't buy it. I think the best part about this was the X-23 Beast interaction. And then I also see what they're doing with the duality of clones, because you also have... The, the clones of Emma Frost in here. Right. Um, so the clones of Emma Frost, they're celebrating their birthday because they feel human. X-23, it's her birthday, but she doesn't want to celebrate it because she doesn't feel human. It's just a marker, a, a biological marker and stuff. So I see they're playing with a duality there. Um, but it didn't grab my interest enough for me to really care where this book goes. Uh, and so, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to grade it right now. I'm just going to give it two couch Cheetos. I think I'm going to go a little higher, and the only reason I will... Did you mention the duality between her not wanting to celebrate her birthday, and then her sister finds out they're called the uh, Stepford Cuckoos? Is that Cuckoos. what they are? Cuckoos. Is yeah. that what it is? They are celebrating their birthday to the. They tell Laura and right. Gabby about it, so Gabby's all worried about her birthday. So it adds this character diversion between Gabby X23 and then the, the sisters. Um, it's just the way this book ended. I go, you it, know what? I, yes, I, I'm, eh, I'm over this already. I mean, by no means is it a bad book. If you're a fan of the characters, it's probably a good read for you. I'll say the art is great. The art's great. good, the especially art great. the uh, characters at the end that they introduce. I the, really that grotesque oh, look yeah, it's, is it's, it's nice. It's good. Um, I'll give it two and a half couch Tito's. Okay. 
All right, Josh, and you're moving on to Adamantium Agenda, number three. Yes. Um, were you afraid I wasn't going to say Adamantium? Hunt for correctly? Wolverine, Adamantium Agenda, number three. All right, thank you. <laughs> Apparently, that means go. Okay, right, Taylor and Silva. Um, personally, if you guys have been reading Hunt for Wolverine or any of its tie-ins, I personally f find that uh, the Adamantium Agenda is the best one. Absolutely. Out of the Calls of the Killer, uh, Mystery of Metapore, Weapons Lost, Weapons Lost is a, uh, it's right there, r right underneath the Adamantium Agenda, but still this is great. And it, you're still, they're dealing with this uh, black market, Sinister selling the d genetic, uh, genetic DNA of Danielle Cage. Apparently he's supposed to have one of Wolverine. That's what they're suspecting, that, that maybe he has her body. But uh, you have a great lineup of characters, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Man, Spider-Man. And then after reading Amazing Spider-Man, it's fun to read something else in Spider-Man right afterwards. Um, yeah, I find this, this is probably not my favorite out of the three issues. This is the third issue, so it's not my favorite. I probably would give it uh, 2.75. Um, couch Cheetos. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I like this book enough. I, I like the time period that it's set in because it's part of the Mighty Avengers, New Avengers uh, stuff right in the Civil War era that they're setting this book in. I like that. Well, in the beginning of it. Right, and yeah, I like... They keep flashbacking. Yeah, and I think... Uh, I think. Um, oh, crap. Taylor, right? The writer. Yeah. Yes. Tom Taylor. I think he actually writes Tony Stark really well. He doesn't do the carbon copy. Like, let yeah. me just make him snarky and shit. So, I like that. I like that he's using his intelligence. I like the way he writes Spider-Man pretty well. Um, but I have to say, reading this and and X-23, X-23 is actually better utilized in this book, and it's not even about her. I think she's just a better character in this book. Um, but it's interesting, especially the very end. Um, I like that, they're, again, Iron Man, is, is they get to sh showcase him a bit and show him off. I love that. Uh, but one thing I didn't like was, you know, a certain part, everyone kind of gets their own Iron Man armor. Didn't really dig that. But. I thought it was pretty funny. I mean, yeah. I, it's like it's one of those just, cool things, but like when you look at it in the grand scheme, like, what makes like, Iron it's Man more? It, yeah. Iron Man's not really unique if you're gonna do that. But uh, you know, I'm right there with you. Two point seven five couch Cheetos. The ending has me hooked. Yeah, so. same here. All right, and uh, Dallas, what did you want to move on to? So we're gonna talk about Josh and I, Deadpool Assassins number three, by Colin um, Bunn, one of my favorite. Neutral writers. Neutral. He he is the guy that you call in when a book when the writer's like, you know what, I'm done writing this book, yeah. and it's like, well, we want to continue this going. The sales are really good. You get He's bond. the chameleon <laughs> writer. He's the guy that's like, okay, I'm just gonna try and copy what you did. And, and we're not we're not trashing on him. What we're saying You're is just being honest. Yeah. I mean, kudos to you. You you do a good job at mimicking. I hear Harold County is pretty good. It, it, that it, that actually is a good book. Yeah. Back to this. Yeah. So Josh and I both read this. I, however, have not read the first two issues, but Josh has reviewed them, so I've yes. gotten the gist of them. Um, basically, this picks up in New Orleans. Yes. Am I correct in saying New that? New Orleans. And this Assassin's Guild is after Deadpool because he has killed some people. Am I correct in saying that as well? Yeah, you're close. Yeah. All right. So, um, the way it's written, it does feel very Ryan Reynolds-y minus, like, certain comic iterations with chimichanga and butt jokes and poop jokes and immature humor. So it's got relevant humor that's funny, but not like, haha poop, like, you know, not intelligent. So the writing, at least <laughs> comedic wise, is actually somewhat intelligent. Um, action is yeah. all over the place. There's a lot of action blood. and So if you're into that, you a lot of action, a lot of intelligent Deadpool writing, this is probably a book for you. Um, you do get an introduction to some characters that weren't in the series already, am I correct? They were in the second issue. They were in the second issue? Yeah, it was more of like a surprise thing at the end. Well, they're in it a little more now. Yeah. Um, I really did enjoy some of the characters. I'm not going to go into names and like specifics just in case they haven't read Deadpool 2. Yeah, um, Deadpool Assassins 2. So I really did enjoy this issue and I might actually continue reading it. So for someone who hasn't read, I feel like I jumped on and understood it enough to continue. So Josh will give you, I've read the whole series review. So go ahead with that and then we'll give our ratings. Uh, the second issue, um, you do, what happens is uh, Deadpool is tied to, Weasel's helping him get some uh, clients. And so by this point, he is trying to hunt or save a certain client and you find out that this client is actually a very bad man and that Weasel, no, no, like he's supposed to be saving him, be his bodyguard. I got you. And he's a very bad guy very bad. and Deadpool's not getting into that, you know, and uh, he's trying to save them from the Assassin's Guild. So they, this, he actually takes the hit from them. But regardless, I'm not going to go into huge details about it. Uh, the humor is still there, but it's just not as raunchy. Um, 
I personally give it about a 2.5 uh, Couch Cheetos. It's not my favorite of the series yet uh, so far. My favorite was the last issue. I think I'm gonna give it three Couch Cheetos, and for some reason I wanna say this, I keep wanting to say Space Cheetos, it's <laughs> our Space Forces. So anyways, I give it three out of five Couch Cheetos. Who knows what happens to a Cheeto once it gets into the cushion. It can go to space. It can be like all kinds of different dimensions. Okay, you wanna talk about champions? <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, I mean, we did read Die, Die, Die. Yes, right, but, we'll do that at the end. Okay. Ignore the Die, Die, Die. Okay. Uh, so, I read uh, Champions 22. Um, writer's uh, Jim Zub. Artist is Kevin Librarden. Da? Librarden. Da? Uh, Lebranda. <laughs> Lebranda? Library. Da. I feel like he's trying to trick me. Uh, so, Champions has been a really good book. It's even better now that they have a new team. The only problem is that I have with this certain book is right in from the start. You have Amadeus Chow, Totally Awesome Hulk. He doesn't look like Totally Awesome Hulk. He looks like uh, just a taller version of him and his normal self with green skin. The problem is, is I didn't read Incredible Hulk 717, so I have no clue why. Then, but um, Riri has some new armor, so they kind of spent some time on this, and Nova lost his helmet. So he, now he's just Sam, and he's dealing with that conflict. Um, it's a really good introduction. This, this whole story has a lot of conflict, a lot of teen angst and drama, and I really enjoy that. I think this book is getting a lot better since they changed up their creative team and since Wade has left. Uh, I'm going to give this a 2.75 Couch Cheetos. You and your teen angst, that Nightwing. I just, love, teen, love angst, teen angst, man. Yeah, angsty bitch. Okay, uh, I also read uh, Star Wars Darth Vader number 18. I've been reading the series, but I haven't actually been reviewing it at all, so I wanted to make sure that I you know, threw it a bone. It's by Charles Soule and Giuseppe Kemencoli. Giuseppe. It's a weird name, but uh, basically this is just a, an issue. I'll just focus on Vader and his survival skills and how... Basically, he's, he feels that since he's killed the entire Jedi, he wants to know if he can be killed anymore. Like, he's a weapon for killing, but there's no one to be killed, so he wants to test whether or not he can be. Uh, basically, it's kind of like this thrill. So he basically employs Tarkin to try and kill him with a platoon of people, and you, you see uh, Vader employ all these uh, survival techniques on this, on this island, or on this planet and stuff. It's pretty cool. It's a fun little read. At the, at the beginning, you're not exactly sure what's happening, but by the end, you're like, Vader is still a bad motherfucker. And even though we never see him move like this in the movies, you know, he's very robotic. He's much more agile here. Um, I take it for what it is. It's a comic book. So, uh, I enjoyed it just I enjoyed it just fine. It's nothing that, that stuck with me, but uh, 2.5 Couch Cheetos. Right. And everything's taking a hit because of Amazing Spider-Man. I know. I don't know well, if it's just like because everything is weighed against the greatness of Amazing Spider-Man that everything else just kind of fell flat, but, you know. Now I'm getting into my indie publishers. This one, it's hard for me to review. I read this again. I read everything before The Amazing Spider-Man. Transformers Unicron. I was kind of excited to get back into Transformers. I haven't read anything or watched anything other than the Michael Bay movies since Transformers Armada. So I haven't had any experience with Transformers in like 10 years. So I was I was excited. Unicron's a familiar name to me from the Armada universe. And the creative team on this is John Barber and Alex Milne, if I'm saying that correctly. Alex um, Milne, Milne on the art? Yeah. Um, art's really good in that. Art's good. That's about it. <laughs> this book might Is be... Rom in it? This is. No, they... Yes. Oh, yeah, he is. This Dude, book sick. may be... Up there yeah, for really one of the pitched. worst, <laughs> one of the worst books I've ever read, and not because you know I didn't agree with some. It's so hard for me to review this. It's all over the place. There's a plot lined out, point A and point B, and they're giggling. I'm not sure why. <laughs> it's the way you got it so hard. <laughs> You're still laughing about that. Yeah, I just keep replaying my <laughs> rums in it. <laughs> it was okay. Anyway, all right. Exciting. Anyways. <laughs> This is probably the best thing about this review, your guys' humor, because outside of this, <laughs> this book was absolute garbage. Um, there's a lot going on. Like you said, the artwork's good, so there's this nice two-page spread of this battle. Basically, Unicron's coming back, and the Autobots and Decepticons are banding together to try and fight him from ending their Cybertronian race, as well as attacking Earth, because that's their quote-unquote adopted planet. So they're the final force to try and stop them. And I mean, this book, it just jumps from this character to this character to this character. And none of it's well written, and all of a sudden, these people are on the same team going on, I'm not revealing names. They're going along, and all of a sudden, there's no panel or anything. Optimus Prime just says something. He's like, 
Oh yeah, this person's not with us anymore. Though they didn't show you or tell you nothing. It just, snap of the finger, this person's not with us, they're against us now. Even though they clearly show it later, they're not. I'm not sure if this book is like a lead up event thing that they've been building towards or not. I kind of get the feeling it's probably what it is. Whoa. It's like a build up from other uh, spin offs of the Transformers books. They should probably build it up to cancel it. Okay. Well, that's hey. what they should do. Rom's in it. Rom's in it. There's some exploration on his like knights group here. So I'll let you flip through that at a later time. I would not recommend this book. I may be wrong and someone may like this, but I don't see why anyone would. Well, so I'm I mean, giving how this, low can you go? I'm going to give this like. A point two five or point five. Oh wow! Okay. Wow! So Couch on this does. podcast, legendary things, we have a point five or a point two five rating, which is and the lowest we've ever given. All three of us have a five point five or five um, out of five. Yeah, rating for the same Jeez, book. Jeez, man, that's God crazy. Awful. We're all over the place. All right, We're breaking records today. The last thing we're going to talk about, Josh and I read. Um, so basically, Image and Robert Kirkman sent us this free issue to uh, advertise his new book called Die 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 by Robert Kirkman and Chris Burnham. And it's supposed to be a political intrigue kind of book with, you know, gratuitous cursing, gratuitous violence. Uh, and I'm no sh I'm no stranger to that stuff. But when you feel like it's in the book just for the sake of being in there, just, just to throw the word cunt or fuck in a book just for the sake of it, it's pretty transparent, thinly veiled. And um, I'm going to say right now, I'm glad they sent us this book for free. I would definitely not want to pay for this. I'm sorry, you know, Kirkman. I'm just calling it like I see it, dude. But... This book from Skybound, I an image. I, I don't. I don't even know. I can't. I couldn't even make heads or tails of the first half of this book. I couldn't tell what the hell was going on. There's a narration over a bunch of just random images, and it's about government and shadowy government organizations doing stuff behind the scenes that you would never want to know about. And it's, it's dumb. And the very end, they reveal like this. There's triplet brothers, and it's like, who's spoilers? No one's picking this up. Um, <laughs> so I don't spoilers, know. Spoilers, bro. This is easily a point seven five. From from uh, couch Cheetos for me. What do you think, Josh? From couch Cheetos. From okay. couch Cheetos. Um, <clears throat> it felt like a like a Shane Black rejection screenplay. Like it was like something that somebody was like, "Hey, Shane Black should direct this." I mean, there's a character that like looks and even has written to have the same kind of accent as uh, Jason Statham. Um, I, I the. Or maybe I don't a guy know. Richie film, maybe. The book was a hit or miss. I mean, for me, I there's parts of me that kind of goes, I would probably read the second one, but only because I work here, and if we have it on the shelf, then I will probably read the second one. The one thing I, the best thing that I like about, or the one thing I like about this whole book is at the end there is a like a it's an a editorial yeah. note from Robert Kirkman, and it's just pretty much just about how he appreciates comic book shops yeah. and comic book retailers, knowing that it's not an easy task to have a comic book shop opened right now. And this and this kind of with the economy and everything when after the 90s and the bankruptcy and comic books and all this stuff like that. And just him talking about how when he used to go into comic book shops, it was a magical experience. And so he just really appreciates it. And that's the reason why they sent out these books and to retailers yeah. as a like kind of appreciation. and. I, and even though it's not the greatest book, I mean, I do appreciate that. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, though, he did the same thing with Oblivion Song. He wrote that on the back of the door poster they gave us, too. Like, there's a long editorial Still, note. Nice. You know, I, I appreciate the gesture from him. I'm just saying, if I'm judging the book based on its own merits, it definitely feels like a first attempt at, like, hey, maybe we can make a movie or a TV show out of this. Here's, like, some really raw material that we could work with. But this is not a coherent story. Yeah, but Kirkman always, like, has way too much. Like, not, not way, like, I say it like this, it makes me sound prudish. I like gore. I think it's fun. But if you ever, like, I mean, a lot of his books, he always tries to add, uh, like, tries to take it to the top with the gore. Um, I give this one dirty, lonely, dusty couch geo. Just one. All right. That week that you that have you can to share, share. That you have to share. Sure. Share. All right. So my last one. Oh shit! I forgot you had one. Yeah. <laughs> Aliens Dust to Dust from Dark Horse Comics. The creative team is Gabriel Hardman, Rain Barreto, and Michael Heisler. Um, the artwork in this is very unique to its own, but it's very what they call like scratch art. So there's a lot of lines, and it's great when you see like a character and dialogue, but when it comes to action, it. It obscures everything, like you can't tell exactly what's going on, so you kind of really have to magnify and look at it to understand it, and it takes you out of the story. However, this story is pretty self-contained, so I didn't need to read the first one. 
and it's pretty straightforward. This group's on a ship, the alien, the the baby, I'm blanking out on the xenomorph, xenomorph? baby, the baby, oh, yeah. the face, not the face hugger, but the baby xenomorph. Right. It's on board, they're flying through, and they're like, oh, there's one on board, we gotta land, and they land, they try to call for help, and I'm gonna leave that up to the readers if they wanna read it. So it's a pretty straightforward story, nothing crazy happens, nothing that, as you said, blew my hair back. So this one's probably gonna get like a one and a half, Couch Cheetos, I mean, it's like the one, and then I add a little half, like one broke off and fell in the couch after you ate it. Okay. Well, guys, basically what we're saying, this is the most long-winded way of saying, get your hands on Amazing Spider-Man number one. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to regret it. You're going to love it. Um, I don't think there's it's, anyone who can call themselves a Spider-Man fan who just is not going to fall in love with at least some part of this book. Also, a lot of comic book shops are going to have a free, per one customer, uh, free behind the scenes behind the scenes yeah. book where you can get the pen see the pencils of Ryan Otley's art for the book that's actually beautiful just to see that it's great it is so basically ignore everything we said other than the stuff with Amazing Spider-Man because <laughs> I mean that's that's the book you should be going after right now like if you were like a Pokemon hunter like this is the this is your fucking Charizard you know so uh, guys do you have anything else to add before we head out of here Get the Amazing Spider-Man number one. Yeah, get that. Uh, guys, we really hope that we hit 700 subscribers with these videos. We really appreciate you guys listening. We hope that you like the format of us splitting up between DC and Marvel. And uh, definitely comment below. Let us know what you guys are reading. If there's anything you'd like us to cover for you or if you just have any recommendations for us in general. We appreciate it and we will see you guys next week. Take care.